Welcome to In It to Win It. This is Steve Barton, and thank you for tuning in. We are here with returning guest Steve Penny of Silver Chartist. Steve, thank you for coming back on the show. You bet, Steve. Uh, thanks for inviting me back. been following your channel for a little bit now. Uh, you put out great content, and it's been cool to see your channel growing. So keep up the good work, and uh, we're talking on an exciting day here with uh, the price action in the metal. So look forward to a good, good conversation. Yes, thank you. That means a lot coming from you. I appreciate that. It, uh, we're up to almost 6,000 subscribers. Uh, nice. Just got a great, uh, uh, you know, got a great group of, uh, of people that are always uh, tuning in and, and leaving comments and, and sharing. And uh, this has been an amazing ride. And I look forward to uh, 2024 as well. It, um, okay, we got a lot in the news today. Uh, we had the Federal Reserve, uh, they're, they're pausing their rates. And we were talking before the show, and I was placing some gold bets. And then I got a call from my buddy about Franco Nevada. We talked for an hour. I came back in front of the screen and I missed like a 6% move in GDX, which I was just about to place before he called me. <laughs> I just missed all these. Uh, we're going to go over them. So we're going to go over gold, silver. We'll pull up oil. We'll talk about Franco Nevada and the questions you guys submitted. So I'm, I'm really excited for this one. Likewise, likewise. Same with Franco Nevada. I mean, I've been watching that one for the last few weeks. And sometimes, you know, bearish news is bearish news, but then the market just overreacts. We sent out a buy alert to our members on that one last night. So uh, through, some, through some luck, I was able to get a big position in that one this morning before the big pop. pop. Nice, but, nice. Yeah. <laughs> nice. We're, we're, looking at the, we're looking at the same thing, so that's cool. Yes, yes. Yeah, we, got, we bought uh, it at 107, I think the day before yesterday. And then uh, we got it again today at either 104 or 103. I don't remember. Nice. And then I set a limit order for 100, and, and that may be a pipe dream now. <laughs> uh, but uh, <laughs> yeah, pretty exciting. Yeah, so as far as Franco Nevada, maybe we'll get in on that first. We had a lot of questions on that. Uh, so just some fundamentals of what happened, as I understand it. Um, so first, Quantum's got um, uh, a mine down there. It's uh, uh, Cobra. And that was uh, Franco Nevada's biggest uh, holding. And so it was 16% of their, their um, uh, net present value, net, net present value. And since then, depending on where you measure it, the stock has fallen by about um, 35 or 40% because the country of Panama, the government shut down that mine. Now, what's interesting about this is that one mine produces 5% of the country's GDP and they just shut it down. Mm -hmm. And it is responsible for over 25% of Panama's export earnings. Okay, it's the second largest tax contributor. So if you just look at the valuation alone, and then, you know, they lost 16% of what they're worth, but it dropped by twice that. Well, that's a good bet in itself. But then also the other side of the coin is that, uh, is the government going to be able to sustain a tax uh, or a uh, revenue hit like that to their GDP and their populace and not open this thing back up? I don't know. You, you're kind of seeing the same thing I am, right? I am. Yeah. So just to maybe taking a quick step back. Um, anyone who's been around silver charts for a while knows, you know, I'm a big advocate for owning physical metal stored outside of the banking system first, and then building like some core positions in blue chip royalty plays and some of the bigger dividend payers like Agnico Eagle, things like that. And Franco Nevada has always been one of my favorite. I mean, it's been the best performing gold precious metal stock for the last decade. Um, not many gold stocks have gone up to the right at a 30 degree angle for the last decade. And Franco Nevada is the only one I can think of, but I've never bought it. I mean, I've owned it here and there for trading positions, but I've never owned it for long term because it's always been um, more fundamentally overvalued than its peers, wheat and precious metals, sandstorm gold, things like that. So I saw this as an opportunity where, hey, the, this is an opportunity to get a, a top tier blue chip royalty play probably the best one out there while the markets you know the market's pricing in that this mine is never going to come back online which it may or may not but i think it's overdone to the downside as you accurately described uh, could i be wrong sure but it to me this seems like an ideal entry point to begin at least scaling into something like franco nevada of course not personal advice i don't give advice you don't give advice but that's my thought process right now so i, I was able to open a position this morning and excited to finally be a long-term shareholder of that company Nice. Congratulations. Welcome to the club. We got them uh, <laughs> yeah. a couple of years ago and haven't nice. touched them since. And that's uh, the way to do it. We're, we're doubling down. <laughs> nice. Another thing, too, is that uh, I remember reading a book once and, and he said, uh, anytime you're making a decision, look at the best case scenario, the most likely scenario and the worst case scenario. And if you can, uh, you know, if the most likely gets you closer to your goals and 
the uh, worst case scenario you can live with, go for it. Yeah. And with this one, I think that uh, the best case scenario is, as I understand it, so they, they have an election coming up in May of 2024, um, about six months from now. And Panama is probably going to be stinging from this loss of income. Um, and the leading candidate right now has said that he's going to restart the mine. So that would be the best case scenario. Six months from now, someone yeah. new gets voted in and they restart it, right? Uh, the average case scenario would be um, maybe someone of similar vintage gets, gets voted in or the same guy and they continue uh, with this and it's closed. They go to arbitration, international arbitration because Canada put a bunch of money into this thing. So they're gonna be owed something. And uh, first quantum, you know, is allowed to restart production. Franco Nevada is uh, uh, allowed to start collecting the royalty. They're both given a check for their downtime, um, you know, but that could have a timetable of two to four years. I have no idea. Uh, you know, anything like that takes a long time. Worst case, let's say they don't uh, restart the mine. They go to arbitration. Nobody gets anything, which is highly unlikely, I think. Um, then you're still at a valuation where it lost 16%, but it's fallen by 35 or 40 Yep, so I think this is one of those rare scenarios where, where the best case scenario is also the most likely. And mm -hmm. uh, I think this is just a golden opportunity, like you said, in a, in a company like this. Agree. Yeah. Contrarian investors look for asymmetric opportunities where the upside potential is greater than the downside risk. And, you know, if you've got that kind of risk tolerance and that kind of calculus in your mind, like you just laid out the risk reward. Yeah, this, this is a fantastic speculation. And there's 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 a handful of good opportunities out there. And this this is one that just came across my radar recently. But I, yeah. it sound, you, you've been tracking this one. You, congratulations, you've owned shares longer than me, and I'm sure you benefit from that. <laughs> yeah, well, I bought them at a higher price, but uh, oh, okay. that's right. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. You, you mind sharing your screen? Maybe we'll just, we'll pull up Franco Nevada real quick while we're on that one, and then we'll move to the others. Yeah, yeah, we'll start right with Franco. And... <clears throat> Won't, won't be too uh, in the weeds here, but this is my, the way my trading view account looks. And I always start with four screens open. And, you know, top left is longer term monthly candlesticks. Then right below there is weekly and then the daily and then the intraday just for, you know, if you're day trading or looking to pinpoint a precision entry point. But I like to go big to small. So here's the long term monthly chart for Franco Nevada. Um, I would normally clean this yeah. up a little bit more. Yeah. So you can just see right here. I mean, this stock was up at, you know, 170 and here we are down at just above 100 last night yeah so i mean that's a massive drop over 40 percent from the absolute peak to the most recent low so when you can get the arguably the best royalty play in the world for a 40 percent discount when gold is trading uh right near all-time highs yeah those are the kind of opportunities that contrarians wait for um so when i zero in on the daily chart here not to be overly simplistic, but one thing I look for is just the 200 day moving average. I, I like that because so many people use it. I mean, like every trader, every algorithm, every uh, institution is looking at, all right, where's the 200 day moving average? Is it upsloping or downsloping? And is the price above it? I mean, it really is. Obviously, there's more to it than that. But that's the first thing I look at. And you see a downsloping 200 day moving average uh, with the RSI oversold. Um, so today's candle looks to me like a potential bottom here. I mean, we've got a uh, high volume, big green candle. You know, it's up uh, almost over, over 5% today. So uh, encouraging for at least a run up towards the 200 day. And, uh, you know, I expect to revisit those all time highs at some point um, and break through to new all time highs. So uh, I, let's put it this way for a top tier play like Franco Nevada, I think right now it offers similar upside as one of the mid tier uh, stocks, like where you got to kind of go down the food chain to get this kind of upside potential. But to get that upside potential with a large cap blue chip is a rare opportunity. That's the way I see it. Yeah, yeah, I, I I like this bet a lot, you know, and it, it could have a, a you know three five year time frame. I don't know, you know. Sure. I mean, it's a, if this actually does go to arbitration, it could be a long time. Uh, this but... is actually a bet. So, sorry, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, no. Steve. Uh, yeah, but I, I was just saying this is a better chart. This is a weekly chart. I should have started right here, but you can kind of see this big wide zone. You know, the upper edge is up around one sixty to one seventy. Then you got support down around down around one hundred. Weekly candlestick. Uh, you know, it's only uh, what's today Wednesday. So, but so far looking like a bullish um, bull hammer candle on the weekly candlestick. So more, more uh, evidence to support the the lows are probably in for Franco Nevada, if I had to guess. Yeah. You got major, major support down at 77. That's the COVID lows. Don't yeah. think we're going down there, but who knows? Yeah, yeah. Okay. 
Uh, I'm going to pull up uh, my uh, trading view here real quick, and um, I want to uh, take a look. We'll kind of start from the top here but with the Fed news. So this, this top one right up here, let me get rid of some of this extra noise. So this is the S&P 500 on the Fed news, and you can literally put it down to the hour here when, yeah. uh, uh, when it started. And look at what the dollar has done, just dropped out of the sky. We're down uh, in the 102s. Um, and then take a look at what gold did on this news. So this is on the hourly chart. You know, we're below 2000 and then within two hours, we're up at, uh, 2035. Pretty exciting. This, this was the move that I missed on GDX. Look, I had even drawn the Fibonacci here and I'm like, oh yeah, this looks pretty good. Phone call. (laughs) 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 But uh, yeah, what uh, um, what what do you see here with uh, uh, with gold? Yeah, so we we look at things uh, similarly. Um, so, um, go go ahead and uh, go ahead and share your screen and uh, pull pull up your charts. I just wanted to run through those so that uh, guys can get an an idea of what happened in the in the markets today. Yeah, yeah, I like it. I like it. Um, you know, when I start with the, the weekly chart, not much to say there. You know, the first thing I look at on the longer term charts, is there like a discernible pattern that has some predictive power? Not really much as far as like patterns, like the, on the weekly chart here, you know, you don't see like a cup and handle or on the longer term monthly chart you do. But I, I see, you know, just challenging this resistance, 2089. And when I go to the daily chart, let me zoom it in right there. This is a nice uh, view level. Yeah, the, the initial support is right right in 2000. And we dipped right below that just for a couple of days and then boom, reclaiming it on big volume. So I think the most likely outcome here is that 2000 is now, at the very least, 2000 has been reinforced as support with today's price action. A $2,000 level is now even stronger support than it was yesterday. Um, now, if this fails and we get a, a pullback again, um, which is, is possible. It's always possible. Uh, I look at the 200-day moving average right there at uh, 1963, and then below that, 1935. I remember putting out an alert on Sunday evening um, for an options trade bet for GLD puts, saying, hey, it's time to buy some cheap insurance on gold. And uh, I remember saying, uh, hey, if gold falls from 2152 all the way down to 1935, over $200, almost $220, we're still in an uptrend because that would be a higher low. Yeah. So a, a number to just keep in mind for your listeners is 1935. You don't want to see it close below 1935. I don't think we're going to see that, but that would, you know, that would be a lower low. That's bearish. As long as we make a higher, higher low above 1935, which it looks like we're doing, we're in good shape with gold. Um, fundamentals and technicals both suggest that we're carving out a new base here right around 2000. And the next attempt to break through that 2089 and then 2152, I think is going to succeed and upside targets are somewhere between 2,500 to 3,000 on the next big move in gold. Okay, and that kind of go while we got this up. Uh, uh, listener question: Tile brick, uh, worst case pullback for gold, and then we can bring up silver. Okay, to to me, a worst case pullback, which is always possible. You know, we don't want to. I think that's a good question, and something people should. When things are moving in our favor, we tend to be focused on the upside targets, which is great. But well, we need to manage the downside as well. To me, 1810, it, it would be hard for me to imagine it going much lower than that. I don't think we're going to go to 1810. But um, if we get some kind of deflationary impulse, which, you know, the, the whole system is so unstable right now, it just takes one thing to break. And, you know, you can get a deflationary impulse in that kind of scenario. Uh, historically, yeah, the metals fall too. Think 2008, think March 2020, um, things like that. I think there's major support down at 1810. So if you're the kind of person like me who says, I like to buy and pullbacks to support, I, I'm keeping a little bit of cash available. I call it an opportunity fund in one of these high yield savings things. Um, and that's for if we get the massive sell off. If we get down to 1810 in gold, that's where I'm pulling from that opportunity fund and I'm deploying that capital, even though I don't think it's a likely outcome. I want to have some cash available. So 1810 is the worst case to me. Okay. Okay. I, I was going to say mine worst case is 1620. And that okay. would be a massive liquidity crisis, but yeah. uh, I hope you're right. And <laughs> that the worst case is 1810. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. I, and it, of course, it can always be worse than my worst case. So, um, yeah. <laughs> 1810, you know, I'd say um, I, it's, to me, 1620 is a, such a low probability that I'm not going to. Um, yeah, know, yeah. Don't hope for yeah. a 3% uh, outcome. When, uh, but things like that happen Mar- in March 2020. Who would have thought silver would go down to like 11 and change? That happened. True, I mean, true. 
So okay. That, that would can, be like, can you bring yeah. up the uh, silver chart? Yeah, of course. Yeah, silver's up over a dollar today. Reclaim the twenty-four dollar level. Here's the daily chart for silver. Um, <clears throat> uh, I like this. I, when you see a, uh, a pullback to support and then a dip below support, um, what I'm looking for is a false breakdown. So that would be the 200-day moving average. We dipped below that a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. And then if you reclaim that support, what was a, you know, support is now resistance. If you reclaim that in short order, that's called a false breakout. Short-term traders, day traders, that's one of the most popular uh, trading signals, buy signals, is when you lose support and then reclaim it, you would buy on a break back above. So I, I think reclaiming the 200-day moving average here is going to attract some, you know, generalist investors, some institutions, the algorithms. It's just a key positive development to have reclaimed the 200-day moving average, especially on such strong volume. It's also a bullish engulfing candle where today's candle fully engulfs the previous day's price action. So that's also another bullish signal. Um, so things are looking very good here. That doesn't mean that we just have another update tomorrow. We could. I mean, it's very hard to predict what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day. But I would just say, don't be surprised if we, it's not uncommon to retrace half of a move like this. So, you know, if we're up a dollar today, hey, we give back 50, 50 cents of it, carve out a base, and then, you know, uh, on, on, on and up from there. Yeah, yeah. And what's, what's your worst case scenario here for silver? Oh, uh, well, now that you're throwing out 1620, let's say $12. So. <laughs> you're all $7. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, worst case, I mean, I, I think w within the realm of like uh, having a decent probability, but not likely, Yeah. Um, you know, 2085. That's oh, the, okay. I mean, that's the low from October. That would be a pretty big washout. Can you imagine how sentiment would feel if we got down to the, you know, $20 area? Yeah. Uh, the COT would be fully washed out. Um, and then below there, you know, you got big support at 1995. Uh, okay. I mean, a, a complete full washout would go to the uh, October lows of 2022, you know, down around 17. Yeah. To me, that seems like very, very low probability. So I'm not going to mention it as a worst case. Let's just say okay. tw the $20 area. Yeah, I think I think the average all in sustaining cost for these miners is right around that twenty yeah, that's another somewhere thing. around there. It's like twenty dollars and fifty cents or something. So yeah, to go below that wouldn't make much sense for long. Um, okay, cool. Um, let's move on to uranium. So let's look at the uh, 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 futures market for uranium. Uh, yeah, this has just been an absolute boss, uh, and we've taken some profits. I know you have. Uh, what what levels are you seeing here? So I know seventy three dollars. That was some that was some big uh, technical resistance. You took some uh, profits there. Uh, what what what's your next target here? Is it a hundred bucks? It is. Um, whatever. However, you know some people like uh, kind of give the R. They call them the RSI guys. You know, like give them a hard time. These RSI guys. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a caution signal with this RSI. Look at this up here. Yeah. Um, I'm not t talking to you like you don't know, but like uh, just for the members who, or for your followers who maybe aren't too familiar with technicals, that RSI, that is a caution signal. You can't just ignore that. Now, is it possible that uranium just stays overbought like that and keeps running? Yeah. Uh, if any market's going to do it, it would be uranium. Uranium is such a small, thinly traded market. It can stay overbought for a long period of time. But I would say just don't ignore that RSI. Um, that's a caution signal for me. And what's what really jumps out to me right here is you've got uranium just slicing through resistance levels like a hot knife through butter. It's extreme overbought in all time frames. But then the mining stocks are still right around their November 2021 highs. Yeah. Most of them haven't even broken through. So that that creates an anomaly where the mining stocks are undervalued relative to the metal up at 83. So that can obviously resolve itself in different ways. But uh, one to be cautious of is maybe the metal itself pulls back. And the mining stocks, you know, pull back less or kind of hold their ground. That's one way for that ratio to normalize. And I, I wouldn't rule that out. So that's why I'm reluctant to go chasing uranium miners here. Now, at the same time, if you don't have a position at the table, you could also make a case. Well, the, my, the metal is the supply demand fundamentals are so incredibly bullish, which I agree with that the metal is not going to fall much. The mining stocks have to play catch up. So that's where strategy becomes greater than predictions. Like, so for me, if I had very little to no exposure and I had a bullish fundamental conviction, I'd say, hey, I'm going to get some exposure to the mining stocks here. Uh, you know, scale in with a small purchase. But for those like me who have core positions already, I'm just sitting and waiting right now. Um, that's how I'm playing this. Yeah, and, and you would play it. Uh, so to answer MS's question, uh, it's not too late to participate. We still got some upside to go, we believe. Uh, and uh, you, you'd play that with URNM or? Yeah, my, my three, 
Yeah, I, I really like URNM. If I could only own one ticker to get exposure to the whole sector, URNM has it all. It's got quality mining stocks. It's got, uh, I believe, about a uh, 20, 30% allocation of the physical metal between Yellow Cake and the Sprott Physical Uranium Trust. And then some quality miners, along with Camacos in there, Kazatapro. So that, that's really all you need. But if you want that extra torque, you could go to something like URNJ, which does not have the physical funds or the big behemoths like Cameco or Kazatapro. Or, or then you could, you know, if you're a stock picker, there, there's a lot of stocks that are, you know, have very uh, compelling fundamental value propositions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me, uh, let me share my screen real quick. And then I want to get your opinion on, um, let's see, we're going to bonds. We don't want bonds. We want, there's uranium. What does it look? Oh, we got to go to the daily. Uh, okay. And then uh, Uroy. So here, am I crazy or do you see a reverse cup? head and shoulders or yeah, cup and handle is just part of a reverse head and shoulders. Yep. Okay. All right. You kind of see the same thing there. I do. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Good deal. That makes me uh, feel a little better. But, yeah. And if you want to hang out on that screen too, we could talk about that for a minute. Okay. Yeah. And, and um, so people always want to know how, how to use technical analysis for projections and predictions. And I'd say that's a use of technical analysis, but for me, it's more about making if then statements, you know, if this happens, then I'll do this It kind of removes emotion. But uh, with that cup and handle pattern, you can get a measured move target in two ways. So you can take the cup portion, which it looks like, um, you know, it's got a top around three on that left side of that white line, mm -hmm. down to a bottom around a dollar eighty. So that's a dollar or twenty. Mm -hmm. So once we break through three, you know, you flip it. So you add a dollar twenty to three. That gives you four dollars and twenty cents upside target. Huh. Okay. Cool. Yeah, and, so and, you basically yeah. just take take uh, from from the bottom to the top there. Yep. And uh, and then project that up uh, to yeah, the right flip side. it over, yeah. Okay. And it's a, it's a, it's more of an art than a science, but it gives you it gives you something. It gives you a target rather than just pulling numbers from nowhere. And other other people use that method. It's very common. A lot of things with technical analysis, I feel like, are self fulfilling prophecies. You know, if everyone's doing the same simple things, they tend to work more often. That's why I like the two hundred day moving averages. There's nothing magical about the two hundred day moving average, except for everyone uses it, so it becomes like a self fulfilling prophecy. So you can make a similar statement about these kind of patterns that yeah. are obvious that everyone sees. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And we also had some questions. Okay. Uh, a couple on oil. Um, so here's uh, oil, uh, the commodity itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's floating around $69, $70 right now. So kind of setting up an interesting double bottom right here, right? Yep. Um, and if we're uh, going to invest in some dividend companies or something, we can do Chevron which this is looking like an interesting entry point. It looks like it's carved out a bottom, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, Exxon as well, we've been adding to that uh, as, uh, as we're going here. Hopefully it uh, holds this level. I think that'll depend on what crude does, but um, love these two for dividends. Uh, mm -hmm. They're uh, pretty incredible. I mean, as far as just paying and uh, you know, we can go out here and just, 3%, 5%, 8, 4, we'll round up to 5, 3.5, 3.3. Uh, like these ones a lot. And we also got a question here on Blackstone. Um, these are our entry points where you see the arrows and we even got a limit order on the way down. This yes. one is so good with dividends that um, I am paying a lot less attention to the uh, uh, technicals. And, and just kind of buying on the way down, you know? Do, do you ever find yourself doing that or are you always trying to pick a, uh, uh, a, a support line? Yeah, so, such a good question. And it, there's, it's a somewhat nuanced answer, but I'll keep it very simple. Is for me, I, as you probably know, Steve, you know, I have a five bucket approach. I break yeah. all my investments up into five buckets. So bucket number three for me is the dividend income bucket. And though I intend to hold those stocks for at least 10 years, if not longer. It's like I own Chevron. I plan to hold it forever and give it to my kids. Kind of like the mindset for me is like someone might have a rental property that they just plan to keep forever. So, you know, the value of the property goes up and down. But as long as the rent keeps going up, that's all I care about. So that's my mindset with these dividend stocks. Um, whereas if I'm trading or speculating, yeah, I want to get those precise technical entry points and exit points. But with the, the real long-term stuff like Exxon, you know, when it's, when it's down like it is now, I just scale in a little bit. I'm not too worried about getting the perfect entry point. Okay. And, one quick side note on the dividends, and a lot of people when they say, all right, well, it's it's got, what, a 4.2% yield, Chevron? Oh, well, you can get treasuries for 5% or whatever. So something to think about, and 
we don't have to go into it here for your listeners, but like something, if you're interested in dividends, go just Google yield on cost. It's a very powerful concept. Like if you just put $10,000 into Chevron, for example, you got a 4% yield and you have those dividends reinvested, your yield on cost over time, you know, is quickly going to be up around 10, 12, 13%. That's your actual yield because you're getting more shares and more shares give you more income and you're not buying them. So your, your yield on cost just goes up over time. It's the power of compounding. So d don't be simple and just say, oh, 4% yield, 4% is nothing. You let that 4% reinvest over time and watch the power of compounding work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're reinvesting and buying more of the company. Um, okay, uh, we got a question on uh, from Fiat is dead. Love the screen name. Yeah. <laughs> Thoughts on uh, Fortuna Silver Mines. Uh, is there a better mid-tier silver producer? Uh, maybe you can pull up the charts on them. I'm not really very very familiar with the uh, uh, company. I'm not sure if you are, Steve, but uh, we can at least- I, I used to follow them much more closely than I do. Um, I know they've got operations in Peru and Africa. I want to say Burkina Faso after a recent acquisition a couple of years ago. But I like the- I, I'm not an expert on that stock, but I'll, I'll say I like it. I like- um, mid-tier producers who have production with lots of exploration upside. I think that's the sweet spot. I think a lot of people are uh, drawn to the explorers and developers without fully understanding the risks. I feel like you can get almost as much upside when you have a stock that produces, so they've got cash flow, so the dilution risk and things like that are minimized with all that exploration upside, and Fortuna fits that bill. To me, the concern there is the jurisdiction to Peru and uh, Africa. Uh, I'm not an expert on that stock or those you know, uh, specific operations. But I, that's that's the sweet spot. I like stocks like that. Yeah, and it also has a a lot of uh, leverage uh, to the silver yes. price. As uh, here here's the chart right here, and we can see, uh, you know, this has gone up. What is that? Eight percent today. Silver okay. has gone up uh, four and a half. This one's up almost nine. So it's like a two x leverage mm -hmm. <laughs> there. Uh, I don't really see any kind of entry point. As a matter of fact, it looks like it's going to tap on some resistance here coming up soon. Uh, but that's what the chart looks like right now. Um, okay. Uh, how about uh, we got BlackRock acquiring a large chunk of PSLV. This is from CCB. Have, have you heard anything on that? Uh, hey, CCB, a uh, really good question. I, I've heard some rumors here and there. I'll be honest, I have not done the due diligence on it, but I'll, I'll just admit I would be um, quite surprised to say the least, if BlackRock were actually like acquiring, you know, part of the PSLV fund, like as a custodian, I, I don't think that's the case. If anything, maybe they're just buying some shares to have, you know, exposure to the price. But I, I would be quite stunned if they were like taking over this us uh, product. Um, so that's yeah. my short. Uh, yeah, uh, super. Uh, maybe maybe uh, I haven't done the research on it, but uh, I highly doubt that's the case. Yeah, I imagine they're probably just trying to gain some liquid uh, silver yeah. exposure. Um, okay, let's uh, pick your brain real quick on uh, platinum. One, one quick thought on that, and this yeah. isn't, I don't want to speculate too much, but you know, uh, maybe the question is direct. I just realized this. Maybe his question is why, why would they buy, be buying shares of PSLV as opposed, to, as opposed to the even more liquid SLV, which I think many of our listeners, your listeners, would probably be skeptical to say the least that the physical is actually there in SLV. So maybe, hey, if they if you think that these big institutions like BlackRock want to actually take re, you know redeem for physical, that could that could be an interesting speculation. Maybe that's why they're buying PSLV. Um, but that's just a speculation. Yeah, you know that's a good point because you can't redeem uh, yeah. SLV, but you can. You know, you and I aren't going to, but they can. Right. You know, pull thousand ounce uh, uh, bars off of there. You know, I do that all the time. I'm yeah, just just... <laughs> yeah right. I just throw up my car for fun. <laughs> Bring your pallet jack. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, do you know anything about Fury Gold Mines? Um, can you pull up the chart on them? And um, I, I don't know anything about this company, but we can uh, we can take a look at the chart for uh, Darren. Yeah, of course. Hey, Darren. Uh... Got to admit, too, again, uh, I'm by no means an expert on Fury Gold Mines, but what I can do is look at the chart for you. And this is what you want. I mean, this is a this is a nice, uh, this looks like a textbook breakout. Um, I, this isn't all marked up or anything, but that yellow line is the 200-day moving average. So something happened here. I don't know what. I bet if you go back, there's probably some news or something that happened uh, last week in November and that caused the stock to almost double in a couple of few short weeks. Well, nothing goes parabolic like that. That's extremely rare for something to keep going. So what you would look for is a retrace of half. 
So we went from what, 30 cents up to about 60. So half of that would be about a 45 or about a 15% pullback. That's exactly what we got. And that happens to coincide with the 200 day moving average. So you got a confluence of support right there um, around 43 cents. And then this long tail, that's also bullish. That's a rejection of lower prices, shows buyers stepping in. So I, I like the technical look without knowing anything about the fundamentals. Okay. And, and uh, keep your screen up there for a sec, Steve. Okay. So up on the RSI, I just want to point out to guys, see how it got above the red line right there. And that was an extreme overbought uh, mm -hmm. point. If you can, the easiest way to look at this is once you get above the, the red line, it's time to sell. And when you get below the green line, it's time to buy that if you can, if you can just kind of remember that. And if you look back over history at those points, it pretty, it usually lines up pretty well, <laughs> you know, it, uh, it's, it does. it's not super scientific. I love how simplistic you, you have your setup. I've got a whole bunch of other stuff on mine that maybe I'm overdoing it a little bit. Yeah. And at the, <clears throat> I don't disagree with what you just said. Um, I think you can improve. I'm, I don't think you're suggesting that's like, this is the best trading strategy trading strategies just do that but yeah. it's a powerful tool so like when it's above that r size above the red line to me it's like a caution signal like i'm certainly not uh, i i can't think of a time where i've accumulated with the rsi up above 70 um yeah. conversely you know if it's pulled back towards uh you know rsi oversold well hey i'm going to look for support is there support is there a pattern forming like it's got my attention i'm in the we're in the buy zone here or if it's up, you know, above that red line, just, yeah, just sit and wait, just using it. That's just so simple, but everyone can do that. That can help people. Yep. Yep. I agree. Uh, okay. Can you pull up uh, platinum? Sure can. <clears throat> okay. I'm excited about this one. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So here, here's the longer term chart for platinum. This goes back 20 years. <clears throat> Nothing ex exceptionally exciting on the charts. I mean, you've got this triangle pattern forming, so I, I like that. Let me just make sure I'm not in the log scale. There we go. That's a little better. Um, so a couple things jump out. Nothing like uh, earth shattering, but you know, this this platinum has been as high as twenty three hundred dollars, and here we are down below a thousand. And think of all the money that's been created, the currency units that have been created <laughs> in the last fifteen years. Yes, yeah, it's so, the GFC. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So platinum is undervalued by any metric. Um especially when you start comparing it to things like gold and silver and uh, you know the S&P, even palladium. So platinum is very undervalued and uh, it's forming what's a pretty attractive looking triangle pattern here. And these patterns tend to resolve in the direction of the trend, which you can make a cases up. You've got higher lows here. Um, so I would look for an upside resolution in platinum. And then uh, this chart is an annotated super, uh, anything special on there, but you can see the 200 day. So I'd be looking for a break above this 200-day moving average and then reclaiming the $1,000 level. I think that's coming. Platinum is just so undervalued relative to almost everything else. Um, very attractive. Um, there's bullish fundamentals that I don't think are being fully priced in. Like platinum and palladium can both be used in catalytic converters. Yep. Um, for, for historically, like platinum has been used in the diesel catalytic con converters and uh, palladium in the regular gasoline internal combustion engines. There's nothing to say you can't substitute. I think that's already been happening. Uh, yeah. you know, why, why use palladium when you can use platinum and it's half the price or it was half the price, not anymore. Yeah. So, and can you pull up the chart on platinum versus gold so we can uh, see from someone other than me how, uh, <laughs> how skewed this is? Absolutely. What an amazing yeah. opportunity uh, that I think is um, uh, approaching for this. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think it's down just a tiny bit, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, up one. There you go. Look at that. And it was down to like 0.4 to one not too long ago. Yes. Or not, yeah. Maybe not that low, maybe like 0.43 or something. Uh, no, let me make regulars as opposed to, yeah. I haven't updated this in a little bit, but there we go. Uh, let me just get rid of that one. It's just noise on there. Yeah, I mean, you can see, look, uh, historically, platinum is more expensive than gold. It almost always is. I did a study a long time ago, or I read a study, I should say. Uh, I didn't do the study. I think it was like 80 something percent of the time platinum trades at a premium to gold. In other words, huh. it's more expensive. So it's an anomaly when platinum is cheaper than gold. Um, this guy did a study of how many months over the last however many decades, like it was at different ratios. But simple, simple answer is it's almost always cheaper than gold or more expensive than gold. So when it's cheaper, that's, that's an, an anomaly. 
Well, not only is platinum cheaper than gold right now, it's less than half. Gold is up over 2,000. Gold, uh, platinum is under 1,000. So that is a major historical anomaly that should get the attention of contrarian investors. Then you couple that with a bullish, what I think is a bullish fundamental backdrop for platinum. And I think you've got a very uh, compelling speculative trade here. I, I own physical platinum, a smaller position. It's more speculative than gold or silver, in my opinion. But man, it's got that upside potential to, I think it will outperform gold by a wide margin and potentially, potentially even silver. That might be treasonous to say to some of the silver bugs out there. I'm, I'm one, but it has the potential to outperform silver. And I wouldn't say that about many other things. Yeah. And another part I love about this bet is it comes from uh, three main places. Yes. Uh, Russia, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. Yeah. <laughs> All we need are... is a hiccup in one of those. And this is going to reverse. <laughs> yep. hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah, I love major, it. Major major potential supply con constraints. For yes. sure. And it's such a thin market too. I mean, it, we're not the only ones looking at this. Let's just say a small, small percentage of institutions, high net worth individuals say, hey, I want to get a little bit of platinum because most of the people have zero. But that's enough to move the needle in a big way, you know, to uh, skew those supply some demand fundamentals. Yes. Uh, pl platinum's in a deficit this year. Um, so, you know, just a, a little uptick in investment demand could skew those supply demand fundamentals and result in a higher price. It wouldn't take much. Yes. Yes. Cool. Cool. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, close out with copper. Yeah, copper. I mean, so I like to say fundamentals tell me what to buy. Technicals tell me when to buy or when to sell. So, you know, I don't, I'm not purely a technical trader. I know plenty of people who are successful at that. So, and you can make a case for that because then it removes all emotion. Like I admittedly have, I'm a, I'm a believer in silver because it represents like honest money and gold and stuff, but I have to remove that emotion when I'm trading. Um, but with copper, when I look at the fundamentals, I think you know, over the next 10 years, the projected demand is going to be more copper than has been mined in all of history or consumed in all of history. Yeah. Like the supply demand fundamentals are just extremely bullish. Now you might say, well, we're headed for a recession or maybe even depression. So I, I will concede that that is a, a potential outcome. But if even half of the demand projection, projections come to fruition, even half of it, um, there's just not enough supply and the price is going to have to go up. I mean, the world's going to need a lot more copper, no matter how you slice it, how much more we could debate, but the world's going to need a lot more. And just like I was saying about uranium a few years ago, the price is too low to incentivize that new production. Same thing with copper. $3 copper is not enough to incentivize all that production we're going to need. So the price is going to have to go a lot higher. Um, so I, with that as the backdrop, then I look at the technicals. Say, all right, where, where can I get some exposure here? And, you know, this $3.30 level is key support. That's pretty obvious, just ho key horizontal support there. Yeah. And then you've got this downtrend line. So getting above that, which we're, as you zero in right here, we're like poking our head right there. Once you get above, you know, up around $5 is the next target. That's a pretty big move from down in the threes. And especially when you look at some of the mining stocks, you know, the leverage you get. Um, and I see it uh, just hovering right here on the 200 day moving average. So to, to me, copper looks pretty constructive here. Like it's trying to bottom, trying to break out, hasn't quite done it yet. But um, with, with that supply demand fundamentals, I, I look at this as like a 10 plus year play um, for copper. So when it pulls back to support my scaling just a little bit. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Steve. If uh, people want to join uh, Silver Chartist, uh, what, what can we expect when, uh, when we sign up? Sure, yeah, silverchartist.com. It's a fully transparent over-the-shoulder service with real-time alerts. So I share exactly what I'm doing with my own money, buy, sell alerts, things like that. I'm far from perfect. I make tons of mistakes along the way, which um, you, know, you, you get to see both sides of that. I don't sugarcoat it. But hopefully that helps people to make better decisions in their own investing. Um, so that's the goal. And the best part, I think, is the community um, really is a, a ni nice tight knit group. You know, got people like yourself sharing your thoughts in there and we keep each other sharp. Um, it's not me prognosticating. Here's what's going to happen. No, I'm not, I've been doing this for a while, but I don't have it all figured out. But together we're navigating these markets together, which is kind of cool. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. I uh, like I, I've done two days worth of research on uh, Franco, Nevada, and then I saw your alert. Uh, I think it was yesterday. <laughs> that you were buying Franco Nevada. I'm like, okay, this is, this is good confirmation. You know, we're seeing the same thing. I, I love it. I love the community. Uh, everyone is super uh, helpful and they're always posting in the members lounge, 
uh, things that come up. I'm sure there's probably a lot of stuff on, on the Fed meeting that we've missed while we're on the call yep. now. And uh, love what you've done. Uh, keep up the good work, sir. There'll be a link Thanks. down in the show notes if you want to join us at Silver Chartist. Steve, thank you again for coming on the show. You bet. You bet. And people like you keep me sharp, too. You mentioned doing all that research on Franco Nevada. Just being honest, as we're talking, I'm like, you know more about the fundamentals of the company than I do. So this is just an example of, you know, we sharpen each other. I'm learning from you too. I'm not the guy just telling everyone. So that's cool. We sh we're sharpening each other. So re really appreciate you uh, having me on and the opportunity to come talk about the metals with you. Oh, pleasure's all on this side of the table. Thank you, Steve. And thank you for tuning in. Support the show. Hit the like, subscribe, share this with anyone that you think needs to hear it. It's probably your buddy that can't stop talking about tech stocks. <laughs> You have yourself a great rest of the day, and we will talk to you next time.